Father, Father, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for every single time, Lord, we're able to just get on this Bible study, Lord, and just learn about your word, get to know who you are, Father, get to know about you. Thank you for leaving this book, Father, because without this book, we'd be clueless, we'd be confused, we'd be lost, we wouldn't know what to do, Jesus. We we thank you that we don't have to be like the world. The world is confused and lost, doesn't know how things happen, Lord, but you left your word to give us truth, to bring light in the darkness, to give us wisdom, for us to learn from your people's mistakes, Father, so we don't follow in the same mistakes they did lord what a privilege it is god that we get to know you you're not a distant god you're not some god hiding himself you're revealing yourself daily you reveal yourself through your word and we pray that you would reveal yourself tonight through your word powerfully father that lord it would it would equip us that we would just just get that much closer to you know that much more of you jesus and become that much more like you lord we thank you for tonight use me to speak to your people, Lord, and all those that are watching in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. So we're gonna let we left off on Genesis 35. Amen. Um, we saw the last chapter, uh, just a recap where um these guys, uh, uh Jacob and all these guys fought um they fought this this other ruler because they had raped. His daughter, Dina, and pretty much set them up, got them to circumcise themselves. And while they were weak and hurt, had them all killed. And now we are in Genesis 35, verse 1, where God tells Jacob to return back to Bethel. Amen. So we're going to continue off from there. Verse 1. Uh, then God said to Jacob, get ready, move to Bethel, settle there, build an altar there to, to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob told everyone in his household, get rid of all your pagan idols. Purify yourselves, put on clean clothing. Uh, we're not going to Bethel where I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He was, he has been with me wherever I've gone. So one thing to note, um, why were there pagan idols? Why did people have uh, demonic items? Because uh, Rachel, Leah, all of them that were with, you know, his uncle Laban, Laban was known for idolatry, worshiping and serving other gods. Um, Rachel had taken uh, an item of her dad's that was uh, of a false god. So he knew if God was to take him to what he had for him, nobody could be carrying items, which this is where we learn about accursed items, things from other gods. There's a lot of us Christians sometimes, that's so why I always say, go through your house, go through your stuff. You would be surprised what you might find there. A lot of Christians have accursed items in their home. And what is, it, what is that? When an item has been dedicated to another god or fake god, false <laughs> god, um, paganism, uh, idolatry, and, and these things, uh, believe it or not, have a, a huge impact. Because if we are to go where God is taking us, we God never wants us taking the baggage that we have from a previous life, a previous relationship, a previous sin. That is why if you're to move into something new, you got to get rid of the old baggage. So, you know, Jacob had an understanding. Listen, God is trying to take me to Bethel. He's trying to take me to, you know, the land he's promised me. So I need to let everybody know in my camp, don't bring any pagan things. Don't bring I don't need bring anything demonic. Whatever's no good, leave it behind. It's like as an example, you wouldn't want somebody to get in a relationship with you, marry you, move in with you, and have items that their ex gave them. You know, you wouldn't want. You know, we can't say we're in Christ, and then you bring us a, a Baphomet statue, or you know, a saint, a statue of a saint, and uh, all these things. God, this is idolatry. We're never supposed to have these things. Never in the Bible does Jesus ever tell us to make a image of him, make a statue of him. I mean, there's a, and it's very popular in a lot of Christians. They'll they'll have you know, Jesus on a cross, crucified, and they'll put it in their house, or the Virgin Mary, or they'll have a saint, maybe a Buddha. All these things. 
if you notice in the Bible, God does not want us having these things. He says it here, get rid of, of all your pagan idols, purify, purify yourselves and put on clean clothing. Because if we are to go where God has taken us, you got to get rid of the old. You got to get rid of the baggage. Amen. We got to get rid of old. And that doesn't just talking about false idolatry items. Things that you know may have some attachment to something regarding you that's not good for you, not healthy, right? There's people who hold on to memories and thoughts from previous relationships. They don't want to get rid of items. Think about it. Why don't you want to get rid of that item? That item looks like it seems it has a hold on you. And if you are to go where God has promised you to go, you got to leave it all behind. And that's not just items. That's thoughts. That's feelings. All kinds of things. We we got to leave those things behind. We can't take it with us. We're, we're trying to go with God. Because when you bring those things into the camp, guess what happens? This new thing God wants to do with you, the devil has access to the new things God wants to do with you because you drag the old into the new. You see what I'm saying? And we have we tend to do that uh, even in relationships. For example, God may want to bring the right man, the right woman. But if you bring your past hurt, if you bring your past trauma, if you bring your past insecurity, if you bring your past bad experiences into this new relationship, this new relationship is going to start to look a lot like the old one. And, and it's not because this person is the same as the last one. You're bringing in a lot of things. And God doesn't want us bringing any, what's idolatry? Anything that'll get in the way of you and God and what God wants to do is idolatry. It's not just a statue. It's just not a God. It's anything that we will bring with us that is of no benefit to your relationship with God, it is idolatry. So we want to go where God is trying to take us. You have to leave it all behind. And this is what Jacob was telling his people. Get rid of these things because you need to purify yourself. Amen? And it says here, we're now going to Bethel. Well, I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their pa pagan idols and earrings. So jewelry there's some jewelry clearly because look it tells you here that has uh pagan meaning roots to it and that's why a lot of people i've done deliverance on i've had to tell them take off certain jewelries if you see it's super popular right now people are wearing the evil eye they <laughs> my wife put it on perfect she putting evil eye bracelets putting evil eye necklaces this is how stupid the devil is. And the Bible says God's people perish because of lack of knowledge. Why would an evil eye protect you from evil? Why would a demon defend you from a demon? When Jesus says that Satan's kingdom is not divided because a house divided cannot stand. So there's a lot of people that have you know, santeria, necklaces, beads, you know, even rosaries and stuff like that. You got to get rid of that stuff, right? You got to get rid of the, the statues in your home and stuff like that. And, and, and I think some people, not everybody does it with evil intention, but nonetheless, it, itself, you, you got to get rid of it. You know, in a lot of cultures, people have little angels, there are little, little babies as angels in their house. Get rid of that stuff. You know why? Because God made it clear. He said, don't make no image. Don't make no statue of anything heavenly. Don't make anything. Don't do that. Right? But what do we do? We do it and we stamp uh, our approval. We think we're doing something spiritual. Um, so is there a proper way to get rid of this? Yeah, throw it away. Just throw it away. Get rid of it. You don't need any of those things. Because... They, uh, it, you know, a lot of those things, people have them because they think it blesses their home. They think it protects them. Listen, there's only one thing that blesses and protects your home, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. You think a, a, a devil does not come and look at your necklace and say, I can't touch you, but you're living foul. You think you think, you think you, you got some kind of sin in your life and you're wearing a necklace and the devil's not going to touch you? He could care less what necklace you have on. He's not afraid of it. It's not like the... Remember that show Supernatural where these people fight demons and, you know, you use salt, you use this, you use that, and a demon's going to go. That doesn't work like that. O only the blood of Jesus and when you're living right before the Lord is that the actual the devil is threatened by you. If you you could have all the beads, all the saints, you could have a, a, 
a picture that you think is Jesus on your house, that doesn't mean anything. It's actually the way that you live for Christ that actually protects you. These statues, these, 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 this jewelry, right? Uh, you, you, you have to get rid of these things. I know so many people get, get rid of them. Why do you think when people get married, they give each other a ring? The ring is symbolic for that you're uniting yourself. You're making a covenant with somebody. So uh, what do you think the devil does? He mimics things and it's rooted in certain things. And it goes to, you know, the origins of the Bible. People had earrings and jewelry as covenants with demons and, and packs with the enemy. So that stuff still exists today. And there's a lot of people who still have those things, have items. There's people who I know they have items from their ex. Get rid of that stuff. Maybe that's why you can't get over your ex. That's why you're probably scared of your ex. Think about your ex. You're still in love with your ex, knowing that your ex is no good. Maybe you still have things inside your home that is rooted in witchcraft, is rooted in idolatry, and it still has a hold on your life. You And you just don't want to get rid of it. So it's better just to clean all of it. And some people say, but what if it's expensive? What if it, you know, it, it, it costs me this much? Who cares? Nothing is worth more than your, your soul and your relationship with Christ. Just get rid of it. And some people will say, oh, you're being ridiculous. You're being too much. Uh, last time I checked what Jesus did on the cross was, some would say was too much. So if he did a lot for me, then what, what I'll, I'll lose it all for him. Not, not a piece of jewelry, not any item means more to me than Jesus Christ. If you're not willing to get rid of this, you're showing that that item means more to you than Jesus. And because his word says to hear verse four. So they gave Jacob all their pagan idols and earrings, and he buried them under the great tree near uh, Shechem. Why did he bury it? So no one could ever have access to it again. I know people who try to get rid of uh, accursed items and try to sell it. Why would you sell something? <laughs> If it wasn't good for you, now you're passing on a, something that's accursed. You're passing on something demonic, something sinful, and you're trying to give it to somebody else. Don't just just throw it away where it's not because if it's not good for you, why would it be good for anybody else, right? And it says here they buried it, and as they set out, it says a terror from God spread over people in the towns of that area, so no one attacked Jacob's family. Eventually, Jacob and his household arrived at Luz, also called Bethel, in Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and named the place El Bethel, which means God of Bethel, because God had appeared to him where he was fleeing from his brother Esau. Soon after this, Rebekah's old nurse, uh, Deborah, died, died. She buried uh, beneath the oak tree in the valley below Bethel. Ever since, the tree has been called Alon Bakuth, which means Oak of Weeping. Now that Jacob had returned from Padanaram, uh, God appeared to him again at Bethel. God blessed him, saying, Your name is Jacob. You will not be called Jacob any longer, for now your name is Israel. So God renamed him Israel. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Once again, how many times we've we seen this in Genesis, where God's plan always for his people is to be fruitful and multiply. That's not just talking about children. God, his plan always for his people is, for us is to always be live a fruitful life and that whatever God gives us, we multiply it. Amen. When God blesses you with finances is for you to be fruitful with it and multiply it. When God gives you a talent is for you to be fruitful and multiply it. When God opens a door in your life is for you to be fruitful and to multiply it. Whatever God gives you anything is for you to be fruitful with it and to multiply it. So, when you see a lot of Christians that live a life of struggle and of not having and of lacking, they're always rooted in two things, a lack of faith or a lack of stewardship. Uh, you know, so God wants to work in those areas of our life. Amen. Because God, his plan always is for us to be fruitful and to multiply what we have. Amen. God blesses you so you can be a blessing. God doesn't bless you to keep it to yourself. God, you know, my wife showed me a scripture in Proverbs and I, I was laughing at, where it says the Lord did test a stingy person with money or sting. And it says stingy with food. I was laughing so hard. I said, man, I, I overlooked that verse. <laughs> it says, don't go out to eat with a stingy person. 
And I, so it's like it, as Christians, it is so important that we're known as givers, that we're known as being fruitful. If God gives you a skill, if God gives you a talent, if God gives you an ability, if God gives you a connection, it is for you to use that to be fruitful with it and to multiply. Amen. Because God does not just give you something for you to just sit there and hold it, hide it. It's for you to be a blessing with it. Amen. So we got to be fruitful. And we got to multiply everything that God gives us. Amen. The reason why some of us, we don't have, James says, we don't have because we don't ask. And some of us, what we ask for, the book of James says, he doesn't give it to you because you'll use it in a sinful manner. What does that mean? Sometimes you're going to splurge it on the wrong thing. You're going to go crazy with it. And then you're you're back to square one again. If if you just work in that, have more faith, be a better steward. Don't use it for sinful things. Watch how God will bless you. Amen. And it says, you will become a great nation. Um, it says here, even many nations, kings will be among your descendants. And I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you. And your descendants after you, then God went up to the place where he had spoken to Jacob. Jacob set up a stone pillar to mark the place where God has spoken to him. Then he poured wine over it as an offering to God, anointed the pillar with olive oil, and Jacob named the place Bethel, which means house of God, because God has spoken to him there. I, I, I love this, and I think this is something that I, I think every Christian should, should do, is I, I don't know about you, but I remember places where God has ministered to me, and to me they're important places to me. Church is not the only location that's important to me. Uh, I, I have many locations that I have gone to where I pray and God has spoken to me. And I remember those places and I dedicate those places to God. Think about how many witch, witches and warlocks they'll dedicate places. That's why there's some places you'll go there and it feels dark. It feels evil. You feel a demonic spirit and you feel the heaviness because somebody dedicated and made that a place for 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 demons and for devils. You need to start making places dedicated for Jesus. Let the park that you take your kids to where you read your Bible and you pray, let that be the place where you say, I dedicate this place to God. Let that 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 corner in your office, your cubicle, whatever it is, say, I dedicate this place to God. That when somebody walks by there, they feel the presence of God. It's marked. Amen. We got to mark our territory. Even dogs mark their territory. We need to say, I mark this territory for the for Jesus. That when people come by, they'll know the they'll feel the presence of God. Amen. Verse 16. Leaving Bethel, Jacob and his clan moved on towards uh Eph Ephrath. Uh, but Rachel went into labor while they were still some distance away. Her labor pains were intense. After very hard delivery, the midwife finally exclaimed, Don't be afraid, you have another son. Rachel was about to die. But with her last breath, she named the baby Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. The baby's father, however, called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to uh, Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a stone monument over Rachel's grave, and it can be seen there to this day. Then Jacob traveled on and camped beyond Migdal Eder while he was living there. Reuben had intercourse with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Jacob soon heard about it. These are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. So this is where the 12 tribes of Israel or the, you know, the 12 sons of Jacob come from. It says the sons of Leah were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issa Issachar, Zubalan. Uh, the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, were Dan, uh, Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, were Gad and Asher. And these are the names of the sons who were born to Jacob at Padaram. So these are the 12. This is where the 12 I had enough. of Israel come from. It's so important that we know this because this is where this comes from. When you hear about the 12 tribes of Israel, you're going to see that in the Old Testament. You'll see it in the New Testament. You'll see it in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> that The 12 tribes of Israel, people, what is that from? This is from here in Genesis. These are the 12 sons that come from Jacob. And this is the ones God promised that through this bloodline, through his children, that the nations of Israel would be born. And these were God's people were, were going to come from. 
Verse 27. So Jacob returned to his father Isaac and Mamre, which is near Karath Araba, now called Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac both lived as foreigners. Isaac lived there for 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died at ripe old age, joining his ancestor and death, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. <coughs> descendants of Esau. <coughs> this is the account of the descendants of Esau, also known as um, Edom. Esau married two young women from Canaan. So uh, one thing to know off the top, Esau married two women from Canaan. What did his dad, Jacob, always say for them not to do? What did uh, Isaac <laughs> uh, tell people to tell his son uh, to not to do? And, and Abraham, what was the common trait that they all told their sons not to do? Anybody know? Don't be with a Canaanite. <laughs> Don't be with a Canaanite. Don't be with foreign women. So we see Esau is now starting with a track record of disobeying. And it says here, Esau married two, two young women from Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Ohilibama, the daughter of Anna and granddaughter of Zibion, the Hivite. He also married his cousin, Basemath, who was the daughter of Ishmael, which Ishmael also does not come from a good bloodline. So this is where the Islam comes from, from this bloodline. And it says here, and the sister of Nebaioth, uh, Adah gave birth to a son named Eliphaz for Esau. Basemath gave birth to a son named Ruel, um, Oholaba, Ma, sorry, I'm trying my best. <laughs> gave birth to sons named Jeosh, Jalam, and Korah. All these sons were born to Esau in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his children, his entire household, along with his livestock and cattle. All the wealth he had acquired in the land of Canaan moved away from his brother Jacob. There was not enough land to support them, both because of all the livestock and possessions they had acquired. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. This is the account of Esau's descendants, the Edomites who lived in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Ada. Can you guys make sure you keep your phones muted? Sorry. Um, Eliphaz gave birth to a son named Amalek, which Amalekites come from. Uh, these are the descendants of Esau's wife, Ada. The descendants of Ruel were uh, Nahath, Zerah, uh, Shema, and Miza. These are the descendants of Esau's wife, Basemath. Esau also has sons through Oholibama and the daughter of Anna and granddaughter of Zibion. Their names were Jews, Jalam, and Korah. These are the descendants of Esau who became the leaders of various clans. Um, The descendants of... I'm going to skip this. <laughs> I'm going to skip it because a lot, it's, it's just pretty much giving you the who who was clan leaders and where they come from. So we'll skip there. And it tells you in verse 19, these are the clans that descended from Esau and it's identifying the clan leaders. Why is this important? This is not something I'm they're not skipping it because it's not important. Uh, but it's important in the sense of when you see later on um evil tribes and people that were wicked, like the Amalekites and all them, you find out who their clan leader was. Where did he come from? Came from Esau. Where did that come from? Came from Ishmael. Where did that come from? And you you start to trace the bloodline and you have an understanding why people are the way they are. Just like uh, in today's world, some people don't realize why they are the way they are. And some people don't realize um, what, because there's some things that travel through bloodlines. There's bloodline demonic spirits. If they if they went after your grandpa, they took your grandpa out with one sin, it's going to do it with your father. And then if he tries it with your father, it's going to try with you. And I know some people are going to go, oh, that's talking about generational curses. Uh, that's a whole different study I'm not going to get into. I don't really per se believe in generational curses because uh, Jesus became the curse to break the curse, to set us free from the curse. So uh, I, I don't believe that you're cursed because, you know, the Bible says who can curse who God has blessed. So I don't believe that. But I do believe there is a generational cycle 
generational demonic spirits that travel through your bloodline because they know you if you notice there's a track record because what happens is, is with most people you just become a product of your environment you become a product of what you how you were raised amen there's that's why there's some people you'll meet someone they're just like their father or they're just like their mother and their mother's just like them and just like that and then why because it's habits and and, and 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 things that somebody along the line hasn't put a stop to it and say wait hold on we're not doing this we're gonna follow christ that's why it's so important that you break cycles as a parent that you say i'm not gonna follow this thing that i've been raised I, I, that i was taught to that was right no i break this here so my kid does not suffer in the same patterns i did and that my parents did and my parents parents and my parents you break that cycle you say that no that stuff ends right here with 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 me. This ends right here because a lot of us as parents, we pick up have, and then your kid has to heal from having you as a parent because you as a parent that never healed from what you dealt with from your parents because your parent never healed from what their parents did to them. So it's a, a, it's a nasty cycle and it's not that you're cursed, right? It's not that you're cursed to be that way because what what is a curse when somebody puts something against your will? Uh, God, you know your 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 will's not going to get violated when you you know you're in Christ. You have the power to say no. This ends here. I'm not going to be this way. I'm going to break the cycle. Amen. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go here. Verse twenty. These are the names of the tribes that descended from Sarah the Horite. They lived in the land of um. Edom, Lothan, Shobai, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, Dishon. These were the Horite clan uh, leaders, the descendants of Sarah who lived in the land of Edom. I'm going to skip that. 31, it tells you these are the kings who ruled in the land of Edom before any king ruled over the Israelites. This is important. So if you ever want to wonder who were kings before anyone ruled over the Israelites, it, 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 it goes on to tell you here. We'll skip down to verse 40. These are the names of the leaders of the clans that descended from Esau, who lived in the places named from them. Timnah, Alva, Jetheth, Ohalabema, Ella, Pinan, and so on and so forth. Uh, verse 43, Magdiel and Iram. These are the leaders of the clans of Edom, listed according to their settlements in the land they occupied. They all descended from Esau, the ancestor of the Edomites. So pretty much all... It gives you a list. So when people say the Bible is written by man, it giving you historical facts, historical records, so you know who came from. This is pretty much this right here is ancestry.com. You get to find out who came from where, you know, and where they came from, and and find out why they are the way they are, and it is super important. All right, let's go to verse um, in chapter thirty-seven. Joseph's dreams. Now we're gonna go into uh, Jacob's son. Joseph, there is so much here. We may stay on this this chapter story of Joseph for a little while because this about Joseph, it is a representation of Jesus. Once again, people think Jesus is only in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see a representation of Jesus throughout the whole entire Bible. Throughout the whole entire Bible, Joseph is one of Jacob's sons, a very special son. And there's so much that we can learn from Jacob, especially for what is going to happen in 2024. We, we really need to learn from Joseph. We really need to be like Joseph. So let's get into this story of Joseph. Verse one. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph when Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended to his, his father's flocks. He worked for his half brothers because you got to remember his other his his other sons. They come from different. They come from different mothers, and it says here the sons of his father's wives, Bila, Zilpha, Zilpa. Um, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. So Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his brothers, be, uh, other children, because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph. Because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. So he, so Jacob makes this beautiful robe for Joseph. Robes usually um, symbolize majesty, someone of high importance, a ruler. So Joseph is a shadow of, of Jesus who's clothed in majesty. 
right? And but it says here, his brothers hated him. His own family hated him. They were jealous of him. Jesus is a Jew. His own people, the Jews, hated him. And to, to this day, some they hate him. You see the, the common factor? This is a representation of Joseph. That, that, that God, you know, this is God's man right here. And people were mad and they were jealous. This is a pattern. That's why as Christians, we always have to understand if there's some of you on here, you're like the black sheep of your family. And you had to wonder why. You're probably the only one that really has a relationship with God. You're probably the only one that the God moves in your life. God backs you up and it causes jealousy. That's why when family members don't like you, when family members have an issue with you and you are in Christ and you're living right, because there's some people who say, my family has issues with me. Well, you got to first check your character, make sure that it's not because of your character. But there's a common denominator when the favor of God and the anointing of God is on your life, be prepared for your own family not to like you, for certain family members to come against you. It, this has always happened since the beginning. Cain and Abel, since the beginning of, of creation, Family tends to come against family, especially the family who's in Christ. Now, if you're not in Christ and they're coming after you, this, you know, maybe it's a different reason. But when you're in Christ, you'll notice a pattern that family tends to have an issue with you because they're jealous. They're jealous of the anointing on your life. They're jealous. <clears throat> so it's so important, but it represents Jesus. They hated Jesus. His own people hated him, just as Joseph's own people hated him. Verse 5, one night Joseph had a dream. When he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to his dreams, he said. We're out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up. Your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and they and the way he talked about them. This is why it's so important as, as Christians, especially us uh, that are prophetic, we get dreams and visions. Don't talk too much. God will use it for his glory if you end up making a mistake because God is bigger than our mistakes. But we need to learn this from Jacob. When you start to share what God is going to do, when you start to share... What God has told you and shown you and he didn't tell you, you're going to cause problems for yourself. Not everyone is prepared to hear what God is doing in your life, what he's told you and what he's shown you. That's why the Bible says a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise one holds them back. You want to know the sign of a wise person? One that fears God is one that doesn't say much. And when they do speak, it's because God has given the green light. When I, I'm I'm very leery of a person that's always saying, I feel the Lord told me, the Spirit of God showed me all the time. You, you're showing you're more of a fool than you are wise because a wise man holds them back. There's times God shows me things, I don't say nothing. Most of the time God shows you something, it's actually not for you to say anything, but to actually do something about it. And when you do something and it produces the fruit, that will speak for itself. So we need to learn as prophetic people, God shows you, you put something in your heart, put something in your spirit. Don't be so quick to say something. And I, and I understand that some of us will get so excited. We we expect, because reality, some of us, we have like an innocent naiveness about us that we, we expect people to rejoice with us, be happy and excited for something God has shown you and told you. But I'm here to tell you, not everyone who's in church, not everyone who claims to be in Christ is going to be happy for you. There are some miserable jealous people out there and you need to have discernment about who to share things with i listen there's been times where i've shared things with people and i said the lord told me this and i just watch how their face turns and i see that the, 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 they don't like it and i'm like man i thought we were on the same team and i'm sure that's how joseph felt and, and about him he should have more than than anyone should have stayed quiet because his vision was that he was going to raise above his brothers. That's probably not the best thing you want to tell somebody. 
you know, who here would like it if someone said, hey, man, God gave me a dream and a vision that I'm going to go higher than you. <laughs> not, not a lot of people are going to like that, right? And it says here, verse 9, so Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Once again, he's talking too much. I think some prophetic people, they talk too much. And it says here, listen, I have a, had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed low before me. Which ties to the other scriptures the Bible says. It says, do not boast about yourself. Do not boast. Boast about the Lord. Verse 10. This time he told the dreams to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I, your brothers, actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the, the dreams meant. So even now, he's even having beef with his dad. His dad is now becoming jealous. <laughs> so you see here, and Jesus, you know, references this as well. He says the enemies of a man are those of his own household. So sometimes the enemy will use people in our own household to make us doubt what God has said and what God is going to do and who you also are. In Christ. Listen, if Jesus' own people didn't believe in him or who he was and what he was doing, don't get discouraged when your own people and your own family and your own friends don't believe in you and what you're doing and what you what God is going to do in your life. I'm here to tell you, you don't need anyone's validation. You do not need nobody's approval. You don't need no, nobody to check off what God has spoken and has said to you. All you need is if Jesus said it, if Jesus told you, then you need to believe it's going to happen. And when it happens, it'll shut the mouth of every single person. I don't care who they are, where they come from, how close they are to you, how related they are, that God is going to shut them up. It's not our job to shut them up. God will shut them up. There's a lot of Christians trying to shut people up. It's not your job to shut them up. It is it is, it is not your job. It is God's job. Right? So it says here, um, Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to the pasture, their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me reports. So Jacob sent him away on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the Valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing the sheep? Yes, the man told them. They have moved on from here. But I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw them coming, saw them coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Isn't that crazy? That's why jealousy is a dangerous demon. Jealousy is always tied to murder and slander because when someone is jealous of you, they're never just jealous. They want to kill your reputation. They want to make manipulate how other people see you. They want to control people's opinions about you. They want everyone to, around you to feel the same way they do about you you because they want to kill something in you. They may not necessarily want to kill you as a person, but they want to kill your dreams. They want to kill your vision. They want to kill your fire for God. They want to kill something in your life. Why? Because people who are jealous are normally miserable people and they're covetous people. That's why as Christians, we got to be very careful that we're not coveting things, that we're not jealous of anyone, that we're not comparison. When you compare, there's no way you can say that you don't have jealousy in you. Comparison and jealousy go hand in hand because that's why the Lord says, do not covet your neighbor's things. And I see it happen all the time as Christians. Well, they had the baby. They got the house. They got the job. They bought the car. And you covet things. You get jealous. 
and then you be you start to have a murderous spirit. You slander, and or you're waiting for one slip up of that person to want to slander their them as a person. Has anyone ever dealt with that here? Someone's been jealous of you. They're not just jealous. They try to kill things you. They try to kill your reputation at work. They try to tear your name down somewhere. Those people who tear you down, people who speak bad about you, is because they're jealous of you. That's the reality. No one's going to come after you if you're nobody. <laughs> They're not going to be jealous of you if there's nothing good about you. If there's something special about you that you have that they wish they could have, that that's why they feel the need to slander you, talk bad about you. No, one, I, It would be retarded for somebody to be talking bad about you, slandering you, and you're nobody and you're nothing. So it's because they're jealous of you. So what did they want to do with Joseph? Let's kill him. His own blood. Isn't that crazy? People rather, I saw one post a long time ago, said people rather see you dead than blessed. And, and it's crazy. It's sometimes your own people rather see something bad happen to you than see something amazing happen to you. That's why we can't get discouraged because we learn from these examples of the Bible that somebody has been through it before. Right? It, says, it says here, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. So they started making fun of him. Here comes the dreamer. <laughs> they said, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. They wanted to see, look, look how threatened they were by his dreams. They showed that they were more believers than doubters, that they feel they need to kill him so his dreams would die. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into the em empty cistern here in the world, which a cistern is just a pit, it's just a hole in the ground. I said, then he'll die without uh, our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. They grabbed him, threw him into the, into the cistern, which is a pit. Now the, the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were down, sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelites. Once again, <laughs> Ishmaelites. Traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. <clears throat> Judah, Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled them out of the cistern, sold them to, to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took them to Egypt. What does that sound familiar of? They, they, they want him dead. So why does the enemy want you dead? So it, it's not just... <laughs> So what God is going to do with you is going to be such a problem to him. That's why he's wanted so many of you on here dead. That's why so many of you on here, here you've contemplated committing suicide. You've, con you've thought about dying. You wanted to be dead. The enemy does this, right? Because he is so threatened about what you're going to do. Look at this comparison. Joseph is tr betrayed by who? His own people. Jesus was betrayed by his own people. Who Wanted Joseph dead. His own people wanted Joseph dead. Who wanted Jesus dead? His own people wanted him dead. Who sold off Jesus? Um, His own disciples sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Who sells off Joseph? His own brother sold him for 20 pieces of silver. You see the parallel between Joseph and Jesus? <laughs> Jesus, once it, we see here a shadow... Of Jesus. So, so if people before, right, had to follow without them even knowing, following in Jesus' footsteps, us that we know Jesus, what do you think we need to do? What do you think we're going to have to go through? We're going to have to go through following in the footsteps of Jesus. So you have Joseph here who his brothers are jealous of him, get him thrown into this pit, 
They want him dead because they don't want the dreams that God told them that what? He was going to become a ruler. The same just like Jesus. The, the Pharisees were threatened by what? When Jesus said that he is the son of God, that he has a kingdom, that he's a ruler, that he is the king of Israel. They were threatened by his position. What is Joseph saying he would become? He says he would be above his brothers, that he would be a ruler. So the same thing. So people who tend to be jealous of you, people who want you dead, people who slander you, people who try to kill you. Why? Because they have an understanding of your position. A lot of us, we get upset. We get discouraged, right? When we go through things, right? And it's like, if the enemy is attacking you, he has an understanding of your position. So you need to have an understanding of your position as well. Because sometimes we're like, why are we going? Why am I going through this? Why is this family member doing this to me, speaking about me, trying to have me? Why am I go? Why are they trying to kill me? Why are they betraying me? Why are they this? It, it's because of your position that you, you have and the position you're going to be in. If they recognize it, you need to recognize it. So these things do not discourage you. It says here, verse 29, sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then, so this, who does this kind of symbolize? Peter. Peter playing dumb, but then feeling bad about it after, about betraying Jesus. Reuben betrays Joseph. But he's the one who was being fake about it because he says he was going to come later to rescue him. So you see a parallel. Reuben is like a Peter. And Joseph is like Jesus here. And then he went back to his brothers and lamented. The boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. Another parallel of Jesus again. What did they put on to put on Jesus when they were going to crucify? They put a robe on him. What did they did get that robe covered in blood? Same thing. You see how this is prophesying of Jesus. This is powerful, guys. I don't know if you guys are noticing. Look how powerful Joseph is. We the the, the his suffering is 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 prophesying of the of the suffering coming suffering of Jesus. That his robe, he he would be betrayed, he'd be wanted dead. But you notice one thing: this is another parallel. Did Joseph die? No. Did they kill him? No. With Jesus, is he dead? No. He is alive. His physical body was crucified, but he is alive. And see, they put a robe and got it with blood, the, representing that Jesus' robe would be covered in blood. And people would be under the impression that Jesus was dead. Right here. Same thing with Joseph. So that so his own father would be under the impression he's dead. Little does he know your son's not dead. He's alive. Little do they know this is representing that Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And it says here, they sent the beautiful robe to their father with the message. Look at what. We found, does this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. He said, yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph. To Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the place guard. Another parallel as well. Jesus had to go to Egypt when he was a child. Joseph goes to Egypt. See a lot of things here. <laughs> There's a lot of things here. We're going to do one more chapter. Uh, 38. About this time, Judah. Judah is um one of uh, Joseph's brothers. Left home, moved to uh, Adullam, where he stayed with a man named Hira. There he saw a Canaanite woman. You see, once again, the cycle. These men are not learning. Stay away from Canaanite women. 
what is that in today in modern world? Stay away from worldly women. The daughter of Shua, and he married her. When he slept with her, she became pregnant, gave birth to a son, and he named the boy Ur. Then she became, please don't name your son that. <laughs> then she became pregnant again, gave birth to another son, named him Onan. When she gave birth to a third son, she named them Shelah. At that time of Shelah's birth, they were living at Kezeb. In the course of that time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Ur was a wicked man in the Lord's sight. So the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Ur's brother Onan, go and marry Tamar. That's why some people, when they die, some people die young. It's because people say, oh, God is not, you know, won't take out a wicked person. He, he does it right here. He does it right here. Then Judah said to Ur's brother Onan, go and marry Tamar. So he tells his brother, go marry your brother's wife. Because the law had required, and you would say, what law? The law of God had not been established. This was this was the Israelites, their own law. That's why people, you have to, when you study the Bible, um, you got to study things in context. Because someone will say, oh, that, but see, this was the law of God. No. When do you see God establish that law? The Ten Commandments have not been established. A lot of these laws have not been established. So whose law was it? It was man's law. It was not God's law. So when someone says, oh, God justifies this, God condones this or that, that's not true because nowhere here does it say that it was God's law. And nowhere it is previously does it say any law was established for that. So it, it, this was man's law. And it says here, you must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother, but the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother, so the Lord took Onan's life too. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home. Remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this because he, he was afraid Shelah would also die, like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. Some years later, Judah's wife died. After the time of mourning was over, Judah and his friend Hera and the uh, Adulamite went up to Timnah to supervise the shearing of his sheep. Someone told Tamar, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Tamar was aware that Shelah had grown up, but no arrangements had been made for her to come and marry him. So she changed out of her widow's clothing and covered herself with a veil to disguise herself. Then she sat beside the road at the entrance <coughs> of the village of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah, Judah noticed her and thought she was a prostitute since she had covered her face. So he stopped and uh, propositioned her, let me have sex with you, he said, not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law. How much will you pay to have sex with me, Tamar asked. I'll send a young goat from my flock, Judah promised. But you will give me a guarantee that you will send the goat, she asked. What kind of guarantee do you want, he replied. She answered, leave me your identification seal and its cord in the walking stick you are carrying. So Judah gave it to them to her. Then he had intercourse with her and she became pregnant. Afterwards, she, she, you, you would wonder why this is horrible. This is nasty. Why did this happen to Judah? Well, when you sow wickedness, you reap wickedness. That's why when you do certain things and you don't pay exactly the same thing, but something else bad happens to your life, you might be reaping something that you did to somebody else. Afterwards, she went back home, took off her veil, and put on her widow's clothing as usual. Later, Judah asked his friend Hera the Dumalite to take the young goat to the woman and pick up the things he had given to her as a guarantee, but Hera couldn't find her. So he asked men who lived there, where can I find the shrine prostitute who is sitting beside the road of the entrance to Enayim? We've never had a shrine prostitute, they replied. So Hera returned to Judah and told them, I couldn't find her anywhere. And the men of the village claimed they never had a shrine prostitute there. Then let her keep the things I gave her, Judah said. I sent the young goat as we agreed, but you couldn't find her. We'd be the laughing stock of the village if we went back again to look for her. So pretty much he's saying, I don't want to go back asking the town, where's the prostitute that I, that I, owe, my, you know, I owe a goat to? And it says here, about three months later, Judah was old. Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has acted like a prostitute. Now, because of this, she's pregnant. 
Bring her out and let her be burned, Judah demanded. But as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. So, that, you know, Judah thinks, man, my daughter-in-law has been a prostitute. How does she get pregnant? She's not supposed to sleep around. Little did he realize she pretended to be a prostitute, covered her face. That's actually his kid that he had. Crazy family drama. <laughs> And it says here, Judah recognized. And it says uh, Judah recognized his items immediately and said, "She is more righteous than I am because I didn't arrange for her to marry my son Shela." Judah never slept with Tamar again. Then the time came for Tamar to give birth. It was discovered that she was carrying twins. While she was in labor, one of the babies reached out his hand, and the midwife grabbed it and tied a scarlet stri uh, string around the child's wrist, announcing this one came out first. But then he pulled back his hand and came out. His brother. When I was reading this, I'm like, who imagine that you're pregnant, and you have two kids, one comes out, the hand one the hand of one comes out, like I'm coming out first, and the other baby, like, no, I'm coming out first. So <laughs> talk about fighting for your, your birthright. And it says here, this, this who who has that who's like that too? Jacob was like that. So you see the generational cycle, even those babies. Are, are having a similar because who was being like that? Jacob was being like that with Esau. Judah is the son of Jacob. So you see his kids are now acting like Jacob and Esau. <laughs> then he pulled back his hand, came out of his, uh, his brother and said, what? The men exclaimed, how did you break out first? So he was named Perez. When I saw that his name is Perez, he must be Puerto Rican. <laughs> Then the baby with the scarlet string on his wrist was born, and he was named Zara. Amen. We'll stop right there. We'll continue Genesis 39. And now it's going to go back to talking about Joseph, what happens to Joseph, um, where he goes. Because remember, he gets sold off for 20 pieces of silver. And the story with Joseph is about to get really, really good. And I believe that that... Is going to minister to a lot of us what Joseph goes through, but we'll leave it off here and we'll continue it next Thursday. Amen.